Hello and welcome to Unparliamentary Language, a political podcast that forgot how EU elections work. Um, and how are you doing today, Rob? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Um, yeah, I'm just a bit annoyed that we uh, had the uh, slight mess up of the schedule. So we were going to record about the EU MEP elections today. Unfortunately, um, lots of countries in Europe have a law whereby all of their elections are on a Sunday, which means we can't talk about it until after 10 p.m. this Sunday. So we we can we can talk about general stuff. I mean, this is not like we're not a news organization, so we can talk about stuff in general in like the news section. But our main story tonight is going to be much more closer to home because it's been an interesting day, hasn't it, Rob? Boy, howdy, has it? Uh, yeah. Uh, we will get into it more, but uh, you don't usually get the passing um, of one prime minister uh, onto another. And again, this is another one of like those those bookmarks in history. We'll we'll look at this in years to come and think that was the moment that Theresa May stood down. So, I mean, without further ado, I suppose we'll move on from that into our main story tonight. And our main story tonight is the fact that, well, as I was driving into work this morning, I got a message from one of our listeners saying the podium's out. Um, and I think we all knew what that meant at the time, uh, and it wasn't therefore surprising that within about an hour there had been a speech. Um, I'm very impressed at some of the you know podcasts I follow because I, I listen to the Economist podcast, um, and they had their episode up you know middle of the day already with like quotes from that in it. So I mean we're not the, we're not that speedy with the news, but at least we're recording on the same day. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, how did we to, get here, Rob? I mean, yeah, to, to be a little. So maybe to be a little unfair to Theresa May, um, I imagine some news outlets might have been preparing for her resignation for quite some time and thought it may have happened sooner than now. So they may have been lining up those quotes or lining up those sort of, um, you know, memorials um, to Theresa May even before the event happened. Um, so, yes, I just wanted to we've talked about it a bit in headline quickfire. So so why now so i wanted to firstly reflect on the on the short term issue that brought it to to a head because as i've just mentioned she's been under threat a lot of times why was this the straw that broke the camel's back so um that second that, that this this fourth attempt at t- passing a deal we've already mentioned mentioned that um promise of a second referendum um and theresa may's thinking behind this was that even though talks had failed between her and labor if she offered a second referendum that might be a very difficult prospect for those on the other side of the House to turn down. So even though she'd annoy senior Conservatives, that might convince Labour, who have a second referendum sort of written into their constitution as a result of that um, of that vote uh, that they had at their party conference. Um, it would also force people like the Lib Dems, Change, the SNP to, to get what they want. Um, this might have been a smart play, but the problem is that Labour just swiftly rejected it. They said, no, even with this second referendum in place, we're not going to vote for it. Um, we still think your deal falls well short of what we expect. Labour have been pushing for a customs union type agreement that clearly wasn't, you know, that May wasn't able to deliver as part of the talks. And as soon as Labour said they are out, there was no political gain for anybody from the Lib Dems or change to say, oh, we would have voted for the deal. They just kept quiet and said, yeah, we won't, we won't vote for it. If Labour aren't doing it, then there's no chance it will pass. We won't support this. Uh, on the other hand, it had annoyed a lot of very senior Conservatives within Theresa May's cabinet. Many Brexiteers felt that the promise of a second referendum was against the pledge in their manifesto. Uh, and, you know, more importantly, it would help alienate more Conservative voters away from the Conservative Party. Um, the Conservatives have just faced one of their biggest losses in council elections in like 20 years. Um, they were they were effectively wiped out, um, and the European elections don't look like they're going to be much better. To have an embarrassing sort of defeat like this on the cards, and the Brexiteers quickly seeing that May didn't have a plan B, that she was only going to keep resubmitting their plan, they had to take control of the situation. Um, this, and I mean, uh, we've we've been talking about this before, right? How, how does she keep presenting the same deal? And this is the straw, straw that broke the camel's back, right? Yeah, it, it's the first one that's really aimed to annoy senior Brexiteers or cabinet Brexiteers. Some of them have abstained or some of them have reluctantly voted for it. I think on the third time of asking, if you remember, like Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson even voted for her deal in the in the hope that enough people would be convinced to come through. But that wasn't that party loyalty 
wasn't enough to get it across the line. It still needed some cross-party support. So this is Theresa May going entirely in on the cross-party support thing, but neglecting her own party. Uh, the resignation of Andrea Leadsom, the leader of the House, the woman who had stood against Theresa May in the last Conservative leadership election, um, a woman who was a prominent Brexiteer and had still gone on television. She'd gone on Mars. She'd been on the sofa and smiled her way through every interview and said, no, I believe in Theresa, May, Theresa May's Brexit deal. You know, even me, a Brexiteer, I'll keep doing that. If you lose the faith, that, the, you know, the faith of her, the person who was going to be the one to deliver your legislation and organise its um, passing of through the House, that's kind of the end for you. And the, the cabinet options for May were dwindling. There was... There was nowhere to go from her point of view, um, and as I've written here, we've, we're a we're a week away from you know a week's passed since Eurovision, but Theresa May was finally facing her Waterloo, uh, <laughs> and there was no other choice but surrender in this matter. <laughs> I I hope you spent a long time coming up with that, Rob. <laughs> I, d- I did. Um, <laughs> we we can come up. With, we can have our unofficial. Uh, side Eurovision podcast uh, where we discuss uh, we was robbed we was robbed um, anyway <laughs> yeah so so how far back do you want to go we've, we've talked about this week and kind of and a bit of the withdrawal agreement but you've got a, you've got a note here so how did it start um, which I, I feel is harking back to the referendum maybe yeah so I want to just think of Theresa May's path to the leadership and why it was so unconventional for a, for a leader, and where once she was doing things so right, it has gone so wrong, and so to pinpoint where it's gone wrong and, and why, and might be um, uh, sorry, and might be good eye might sorry, I don't know why I went Australian there, um, and maybe why it's you know what were the what were the catalysts for that for that breakdown uh, between her and the Conservative Party, uh, so I was going to go to the aftermath of the referendum um, and the conservative election campaign. So David Cameron's just stepped down as leader and we have a plethora of conservative figures coming to the fore, Um, most namely prominent Brexiteer Boris Johnson, uh, supported by Michael Gove at the time. Uh, We had Andrea Leadsom, Liam Fox, again Brexiteers, but mostly unknown. Um, And then on the Remainer side, we had a handful um, but Theresa May was the figure from the sort of Remainer faction of the party that stood out. She'd been Home Secretary before. Um, she seemed to tie down that job fairly well. She was seen as many by a as a, as a safe pair of hands. Uh, I was going to say, what, what were your opinions at the time? Because I remember it was before we had this podcast, so we didn't discuss it here. And I remember there were a lot of, I mean, I think, so, I mean, we've already mentioned Boris got stabbed in the back by Gove and they kind of went down quite quickly and then we had oh, his name escapes me but we had the very homophobic guy who basically uh, I was again on those against Steve, on those grounds Stephen Crabb I think it was yeah or, that was yeah. It. yeah all I remember about him was he was very homophobic so he was right out and again we don't have any control in this process uh, I think it's I can't remember we'll, we'll, we'll get on to the how, how that works later but I believe it's that there's like two stages where there's like MPs and then then you, it goes to the conservative membership but essentially, it was very quick, um, and I remember feeling like, well, while I don't agree with some of the things Theresa May has done in the Home Office, especially she seems to misunderstand how the internet works, um, and, uh, well, I mean, we've now seen various things uh, that happened in her tenure there coming out with, like, Windrush and everything. Um, but, like, in general, I was like, oh, she's a bit authoritarian for me, but out of the options, I, I think I'd agree with what you said, a safe pair of hands, someone who'd been in government for some time, and had form getting things done at least, um, yeah. And I, yeah, why? Yeah. How the turns table? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'd agree entirely with that. It's the safe pair of hands, the experience of being in government, a a recognisable face. Um, the stuff coming from the Brexiteer side may have been a little bit too sort of. It, it was quite radical. These uh, the people who were putting themselves forward had never really had a big part in government, and those who had, like Liam Fox, had had to leave in disgrace and um, he'd had to the disgraced former defense secretary liam fox exactly i still have that <laughs> extension on google chrome so that it always changes his name to it <laughs> so so yeah so out of the options she seemed like the best of a bad bunch and uh, one thing i thought maybe a little naively at the time was that she had formally voted for remain 
um, but now had to leave, you know, had to lead a country to Brexit. And in my opinion, that was the person who you wanted to. That was a person who could, you know, have have a compromise. We, we've all mentioned about how close the, you know, the vote was, and but the vote is binding and they will go ahead with it. But I thought that would lead to a relatively balanced and stable Brexit option putting through. It wouldn't be too sort of wild it wouldn't to be sort of flag bashing this would be this would be one that she might be able to unite the country behind um and indeed i've i've brought up here and i might put a link in the chat to it her her first speech as leader was quite promising i felt or at least not as overtly sort of right wing or authoritarian as it could have been well that's an old photo of her as well i, I if she looked like that um when when she made her speech then the office has aged her, and I know that's the thing that being prime minister or president at, president does. But um, I don't think that's a photo from when she gave the speech. <laughs> to be honest. <coughs> no, sorry, that's a, that's an as an old Home Secretary one. But um, yeah, so the lines I wanted to point out was that um, if you're black, you're treated more harshly by the criminal justice system than if you're white. If you're a white working class boy, you're less likely than anyone else in Britain to go to university. If you're in a state school, you are less likely to reach the top professions than if you are educated privately. If you're a woman, you will earn less than a man. You will suffer from mental health problems. There's not enough help at hand. If you are young, you'll find it harder than ever before to own your own home. But the mission to make Britain a country that works for everyone means more than fighting these injustices. So she was sort of addressing everyone. This wasn't a speech for the toffs. This was a speech for, I want to make Britain fairer it was a very uh, what we call a one nation view of conservatism um and almost had policies that were ripped directly from ed Miliband's manifesto in 2015 so some people called it like the Miliband speech or what could have happened if um if he if, if labor had made it to power in 2015 so yeah she was seen as very you know very middle of the road um and there were reasons for there were political reasons for her making that speech as well um at a time where Jeremy Corbyn seemed to have moved the Labour Party to the left and people really didn't know what he stood for yet. Um, I think the 2017 general election gave us a chance to know more about what Jeremy Corbyn wanted to put forward. Theresa May offered a haven for those in the centre ground who, you know, sort of wanted to rally behind someone who was up for making the country fairer, making the rich pay their taxes, but also keeping the economy balanced and, and strong at the same time. So, Taking her at that speech and taking her from the, you know, from the word go, she seemed to be a capable leader. Um, but I think the cracks started to show quite soon after and what she did in the in the run up to the 2017 general election. I mean, does that does that share your view broadly of the time, you know, with those speeches? What, you know, what she was putting herself across? Did you think this was, you know, you're a Remainer yourself. Did you think she'd be able to deliver a, a softer Brexit you know, yeah, from so the word go? Yeah, I think like so as you said, I, I don't I can't pull out I mean, I know we've posted the statement, but I couldn't have told you any particular part of that speech, though I'm pretty certain I saw it. Um but yeah, I think my initial concerns like to do with the home office stuff, at least in the speech and, and her initial initial actions, I was like, Well, she's a remainer, it's better than having someone who's a, a massive Brexiteer in charge because they'll just take us out with no deal. And I thought, oh, you know, it's going to be okay. It's very hard to put myself back into those shoes because this is before, you know, what the premature um, revoking, uh, sorry, premature initiation of Article 50 and all of that, which I think since then it's just been error after error and often unforced errors, I would argue. Um, At least that's how it seems to me. And I think we've kind of discussed that point before, um, although we'll touch on it later, but yeah, I, I think I was like, oh, well, at least she's a Remainer. And like, I kind of thought that was, you know, you'd get the best compromise out of that. Someone who's like, well, we still have to leave because we've that's the way the vote's gone. But yeah, getting a softer Brexit, some kind of customs union. I was like, if if it has to happen, that's the kind of thing I would have preferred. Yeah, it's, yeah, I, I think essentially I agree with what you said. So moving on from that, you've got her presenting herself as quite middle of the road, and then that quite quickly changes come 2016 and her party conference speech, uh, which famously includes the lines, um, if you're a citizen of the world, essentially you are a citizen, you're a citizen of nowhere. Let me, sorry, let me see if I can grab the direct quote. 
Okay, there we go, yeah. But if you believe you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere, you don't understand what the very word citizenship means. Um, and it's this quite whole... a change in tone. Yes. This whole speech is sort of an attack on the metropolitan elite. Um, another extract from the speech I've got here is um, just listen to the way a lot of politicians and commentators talk about the public they find your patriotism distasteful your concerns about immigration or parochial your views about crime illiberal your attachment to your job security inconvenient they find the fact that more than 17 voters decided to leave the European Union simply bewildering because if you're well off and comfortable Britain is a different country and these concerns are not your concerns it's easy to dismiss them, easy to say that all you want from government is for it to get out of the way. But the change has got to come and it's time to remember the good that government can do. In that entire speech, she is frankly le reaching out to the Labour voters that voted UKIP, the Labour voters that voted Brexit, the people who she thinks that the new Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn was leaving behind and that was a possible big win for her to pick up if she's able to pick up those working class voters then she could have cemented a sort of a tory dynasty that could have lasted for for years that was her play there and that also sort of fed into her brexit rhetoric you know we've heard like she said brexit means brexit kind of reinforcing that you know this it is what i say it is essentially um she she also mentioned that um no deal is better than a bad deal that was the you know the other bit that came out before any of this election, saying, no, I, I will strive to get the best deal for this country and I'm willing to play hardball. All sort of very hard Brexity type stuff. I believe that all of all of that rhetoric um, and the and the reaction that she got from the polls, so I've, I've had a look back at our Britain Elect site. Um, I believe it was, let me just get the exact date. On the 28th of April 2017, the Conservatives were 20 points ahead in the polls. Unheard of in years. Like when we've been moving from a time where we've had a coalition government under Cameron that was very close, the polls were incredibly close in the 2015 election, to have such a big swing, she must have been on cloud nine and thinking that everything she was saying was just gold dust. She could do no wrong. A quick aside for the listeners. For reference, the Tories are now polling at 23.8%, which is their lowest since 1997. Oof. <laughs> yeah, a lot can change in uh, two years. I think that proves, yeah. Two years is an exceedingly long time in politics. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wanted to just quickly ask you, Tom, so on the eve of that, if you, I know it's a, it's a bit hard to think back to this moment in time, but before the, before the general election, before it was even called, or maybe just on like the moment that she decided to call one, had your opinion changed of Theresa May from that point from 2015 to 2017? Do you think she'd hardened? And do you think that, you know, I don't know if you ever would have voted for Theresa May and, you know, had you had the option to in 2015? But yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, so had I had to vote in 2015, I, I, I would have been in a constituency that was overwhelmingly conservative. So it wouldn't have really mattered what I'd done. Um, and I, I think... Uh, I think I actually ended up voting for Greens in that election and I did it via a proxy vote because at the last minute I wasn't actually in my constituency due to work. So yeah, I think I, it was it was very much a oh I I need to vote for something and like there was no chance of labor or anything getting in and I was like well maybe the Greens will get a tiny percentage here to at least show that they're not conservative here. Um so yeah. That was the vague plan. Um <laughs> and then um Twenty come twenty seventeen, I was living in an area that's uh, now very liberal democrat. It was conservative, but we've only been conservative for that two year gap from twenty fifteen to twenty seventeen, and I think people uh, got, got very annoyed at the um, the MP actually because uh, he was making all sorts of claims about how he'd tried to fix the train station and everything, and it was basically him using his budget as an MP to send out free um, uh, kind of electioneering material. Um, which is, you know, I think that rubbed people up the wrong way. And so we're back to having uh, the Lib Dem MP we had in the coalition here. Um, back in 2017, um, I was, I mean, I remember being very, that was the first time I really was kind of tracking everything. And there was that new app out, which I don't think you can get anymore, that gave you all the poll stuff. Like I, was, I was more in into it than I had been in a long time 
probably since we voted in the coalition because 2015 came as a bit of a shock i think um because suddenly we were just, the country seemed to go very conservative but actually it was just the lib dems kind of fell out and the the you know we kind of i'd kind of assumed coalition would be more likely and then it wasn't um i'm trying to remember what i thought i, I definitely agree with you that i i feel yeah she'd hardened up and i think in my opinion she'd gone down um but you know but where i was it was a choice between conservatives and lib dem and i chose to back you know with the rest of the constituency the the local lib dem so I wouldn't have voted for her in that election anyway, but I definitely feel like there was nothing she could have done at that point. Whereas maybe in 2015, if they'd been like, look, you know, the, the kind of argument she has been making, which is like, look, someone has to get Brexit done and it's going to be kind of sensible. Like that could have been spun in a good way in 2015. But by 2017, I think it was obvious that she she wasn't going to deliver the kind of Brexit that I would kind of begrudgingly put up with. So, yeah, yeah, it was a... Fun fact on that election, actually, I was flying back uh, from Japan during the election. Did you know you can ask the uh, the flight attendants to go up to the cockpit and they can have the current results radioed to them? And I had a tiny little slip of paper with the current standing of all the parties presented to me at like four in the morning UK time. <laughs> so, you know, if you're really into your politics and you're in the air, you can get that done, at least on a BA flight. So, yeah, that that... <laughs> that airport fact aside, um, to move us back to the 2017 election. So that move was to be her undoing. And I'm going to argue tonight that that's essentially what began her downfall. And if you look at the polls, I think it's very argue hard to argue against that. Um, it certainly dented her view amongst the public. What we experienced in the 2017 election campaign was six months of focus on Theresa May and her policies and what she wanted to do with Britain. But bizarrely, that election wasn't really about Brexit. It was an election that became both parties just accepted they were going to do Brexit. Um, and then once that point was done, it was brushed to the side and everybody looked at who would run a country in what way. When Theresa May came in front of the camera in that election, it soon became apparent to me that this wasn't someone who was a natural election campaign leader she'd always been on the sides it's very you know it's a different job to be home secretary and to be competent in the realms of whitehall um but to go out and talk to the general public she appeared robotic you know she she earned that name maybot for a reason because her responses were stilted and the way that she repeated the sort of strong and stable mantra that you know maybe that was something that she'd been told to do by her campaign team rather than a personal decision but it certainly didn't reflect on her very well um, the policies the Conservative Party put through as well were a little baffling. They were, I think in retrospect, they were too realistic <laughs> as a manifesto. Um, they'd promised to deliver, you know, sort of social care, but in, in moderation. When you compare it to the lofty ideals of the Labour campaign, that was somebody who, you know, was really, you know, Jeremy Corbyn was really pushing the boundaries of politics, who's offering a new type of politics. All the passion and enthusiasm with, was with him, with Theresa May, she was sort of offering you the same old thing, only slightly different. And in particular, some of those tweaks seemed to make things worse. There was an infamous speech on her social policy that basically when the papers got hold of it, they went over it and revealed that that might lead to some elderly people having to sell their house um, or being forced to sell their house. Um, and, and that undermined like a huge part of the conservative sort of core vote that annoyed a lot of people there. And then when questioned on it the next day, even though the policy had changed, Theresa May tried to put forward that they'd only re-clarified the policy and kept saying, nothing has changed, nothing has changed. And that <laughs> that's the one image I have of that election of May suddenly realising that she's, she's losing control. Um, and day by day, the polls got closer and closer and closer. I think we all still believed that the Conservatives would get a majority and maybe increase on their majority from 2015, but maybe it wasn't going to be the Tony Blair landslide 1997 version that we that we thought it would be. Um, yeah, I think I definitely went into that expecting them to win, and it was a question of by how much. Hmm. Yeah, precisely. When the results came through and it was clear that the Conservatives had actually lost their majority and that Labour had gained in a lot of places, maybe more scarily for May that the Conservatives had lost their sort of 
seats in metropolitan areas, exactly the areas that she had attacked in London were now voting Labour. Um, and the votes that she was picking up elsewhere in the countryside didn't seem to matter. Um, excuse me. <coughs> I may have mentioned it before on uh, this podcast, but that 2017 election was remarkable for a number of ways. The collapse of the third parties, the collapse of the Lib Dems and UKIP, meant that it became one of the most sort of blatant two-party politics races we've ever seen. And even though Theresa May was able to return with a, you know, a, I think one of the biggest percentages of votes that we've had since like the mid-1960s or 70s, that wasn't enough when Labour did so equally well as well. And there was nobody else to split that vote. Um, the result was that she came away from that election night tearful, with her pride and her authority dented, um, and with a parliament which was going to make it a lot, lot harder for any Brexit business to be done. You know, one of the big factors were not of calling this election was not only to wipe out the Labour Party, but was to give her enough of a majority within the House to easily pass her Brexit legislation. She knew that she'd have people on the back benches who would disagree with the way that she'd do it. She knew she'd have a couple of Jacob rees Moggs basically saying that, you know, this deal isn't good enough, we should no deal. But that wouldn't be a problem if you've got a majority of 100, 150 in the House. Um, now she lacked it, and now she was forced to go and do a deal with the, the DUP, um, a deal that cost them a billion pounds, and maybe people have questioned the effectiveness of that deal. It it just brought more of Theresa May's decision-making process into question and, you know, how she'd acted as a leader. And I think once 2017 was over, that's a blow from which she has never recovered and it's only really got worse from there so as we said she, she's given her speech where where are we going from here so um do we want to briefly cover how the conservative leader is picked uh, at this point and move into that so um as as i alluded to earlier we don't get a say in this um one of the slightly weird things about our system i suppose is that you don't have like a deputy prime minister. I mean, with the exception of in the coalition, it's not like, you know, if, 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 if Trump were impeached, then we know Mike Pence would take his place by default. Um, we don't have that here. It's just the leader of the majority party is the leader of the country. So if we talked about this, when we said Theresa May had her no confidence vote against her and things like that. So there, there are ways in which you can remove, um, the leader of of a party and it's different for each party this isn't like an agreed on thing it's for the conservatives we have the 1922 committee and for labor they have a different way of doing things and there's no like clear order of succession um like with tony blair and gordon brown we knew that they had some kind of deal or you know at least people assumed and and then that's how that played out here it's very much down to this kind of what, what, what I suppose outside can seem quite archaic and a bit backstabby, a bit Game of Thrones. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we don't get a say as average citizens in that process. And in fact, last time, I think even the Conservative Party members didn't get a say because basically everyone dropped out, leaving Theresa May as the last candidate. So she won by default. So how how does that process work? Because um, it is a bit, it is a bit archaic in some ways. Um, and uh and then who have we got as our options? The way the process works is that you must be nominated by a set percentage of MPs within your party. I think within the Labour Party, it's 10%. I can't remember off the top of my head what it is within the Conservative Party. But you've got to have basically enough mates around you who think you can be PM to, to nominate you. So you've got a feasible candidacy. Then we have a series of votes where the, you know, if we've got 11 candidates or if we've got five um everybody votes for their favored candidate and one, the one with the lowest vote is knocked out and then we do that again and then we do that again and that all just happens from mps within the conservative party so this tends to me that the, the effect of this is that even though a candidate might be popular from the outside if they are unpopular within their party they are unlikely to make it to the front running so in this system jeremy corbyn wouldn't have stood a chance of getting the conservative leadership you know sorry if the Labour leadership was run like the conservative leadership there's no way jeremy corbyn would ever have become leader because he barely had the support of the mps to get him nominated and onto the labor ballot and then if they had a vote he would have been knocked out in the first round this has also led to sometimes the public front runner being 
knocked out um, before the public get a chance to vote. So uh, in the case of Michael Portillo, I believe he was eliminated very early on in a conservative leadership election, uh, similar with Ken Clark, these big beasts of the Conservative Party who commanded respect and many thought were natural leaders just didn't have the support of the party to go forward. So that's the first stage. Uh, the second stage is once you've got the last two, you then put that to a vote amongst the wider Conservative Party membership. Um, so for that, you have to be a card-carrying, paid-up Conservative member. Um, I believe they, and I believe you have to have been a member for a set time before the election. So I you believe can't... it's at least six months because someone mentioned that at work today. Um, because I think one of their relatives had joined the Conservative Party around December and therefore was unsure exactly. Like, it basically depends when the vote gets called, whether they'll be fine. I'd be interested to hear that relative's decisions for joining, joining the Conservative Party in December. Um, <laughs> I don't think they're, <laughs> yeah. don't think they're in now's like the it. time to join. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, so th- that stops there being a rush of, like, Labour people suddenly buying £5 memberships and trying to influence the result of the election. So that's the process, and that's as close as it gets to democracy for the Conservative Party. Um, the aim you may see it as archaic um, and it certainly is maybe one of the less democratic methods that any party has for electing its leader when you compare it to labor's which i think you only need the percent you need the nomination of 10% of the mp's then the rest of the whole process is entirely done on public vote um the conservatives put the command of mp's of much higher importance than the actual leaders you know love across the country their, their, you know their popularity across the country and i mean i think that ties into some stuff we said about the conservatives before where they're they're kind of about sticking together and like like the way the party operates tends to be in with the interest of the party at heart so they wouldn't want to have someone picked uh who they hadn't already like been like oh he's all right or she's all right yeah precisely and i think that might put people everybody's sort of nailing Boris Johnson on to be one of the final two but i'm unsure of his popularity within the conservative party he's been around a long while and has talked a lot of nonsense quite frankly um from time to time uh, and although he's made friends amongst the ERG i know people like Jacob Rees-Mogg are backing him for example um there are big factions within the conservative party that would vote against him given the choice yeah, in in short, the Conservative Party Conservative Party leadership is meant to be deliver a strong leader and a united party. That's what they consider of the most importance uh, when it comes to this. And once it's been to the members, and the members have decided, most of the time the party will pull together and you know follow the person that the membership has has elected. So, given that the problem Theresa May has had is coming up with a deal that satisfies the Brexiteers, the Remainers, etc. in her party. How easy a job do you think that's going to be for anyone else? Because I think we've repeatedly said that, regardless of what you may think about Theresa May, she has at least tried to get on with possibly the worst job you could be handed, which is trying to make that deal work for, for everyone. What what kind of line could someone take to, to try and try and appease both ends? I mean, let's assume they don't get the very strong Brexiteers and the very strong Remainers either end. But like we're trying to get, like say, 80% of the people in the middle on side. How likely is that? At, at this stage, unlikely. The Conservative Party is more split than it's ever been, in my opinion. Um, and the possibility of getting a deal which all sides agree on is slim. Um, for everybody who wants a no deal or who is, you know, when Boris Johnson and uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg were willing to accept May's deal at the final hour, there were still those within the Conservative Party who said that the deal wasn't soft enough and wanted a more sort of Commons Union-based approach. So May's, May's almost done as much as she can there and has still failed. So they they could go back to Europe and could get a better deal, and maybe a sort of Customs Union one would help to get the Labour Party on board. But as it is for unity within the Conservative Party, that is an incredibly tough thing to do at the moment. The other option they have is that they could call a general election. They could say, well, I believe that if I'm conservative leader and um, let's say let's say Boris Johnson does win or somebody who's quite Brexity wins, um, being quite Brexity for the conservative leader would be a good play because they can have a look at the polls, they can see the sort of support that the Brexit party is getting 
they would go, right, if we do this sort of hard line and we're able to win significant amount of votes with this message, um, then we could put forward a much harder deal altogether. Uh, the problem with that is that the Conservatives have just lost a large amount in the council elections and are likely to lose in the European elections as well. It would be a very brave and I would argue a very foolish Conservative leader that would call a general election at this stage. Um, so as it is for party unity or changing that party math, the the <laughs> the, the options they've got are, are zilcho. Um, none, nada, nothing. I think I've tried to <laughs> make that point. Uh, I was listening to uh, another podcast today and they put it quite well. They said that Theresa May's the driver who's crashed the car and now they're all on foot and they're looking for somewhere to go. And it's pretty tough to be told by the person who's crashed the car that you've got to walk faster. So getting rid of her and putting somebody else in charge to give the Conservatives that message might make it a little more palatable, might be enough to get some Conservatives to group together. But the point is the car is still crashed. They're still in a terrible position. And I don't know if anyone can bring all of them back on board, particularly when Brexit isn't resolved at this stage. You, you, Just as it was a bit of a poison chalice when Theresa May became leader back in uh, sort of after the referendum in 2016, now is an even more poison chalice for a Conservative leader. You are talking about the future of the Conservative Party staying together at this state. If the next one gets it wrong, it could go very wrong. Um, so there's 14 contenders for the, for the leadership race. Um, it's eight men, six women. That's a better split than, I think, A, a the Houses of Parliament, and B, the Conservative Party as a whole. So, so that's good. I mean, we have just had a female Prime Minister, which might help with the ratios there. Um, I mean, I don't know. Um, and uh, do you want to... Well, I mean, maybe if I quickly run through them and give like a very brief overview because we probably don't have the time to dive in in depth tonight yeah, uh, I, to, to each of their histories. But do we want to have a quite a quick overview and I'll, I'll maybe, if I go first, because you probably remember more about them and then you can give your response. I'll try and keep my response quick to two sentences and if you want me to go into more detail, then, then let me know. Okay. This is just the, the order they're in on the BBC website at the moment. So Boris Johnson, former mayor of London, uh, famously rugby tackled a child, uh, got stuck uh, waving some flags um, from a zip wire, uh, which is one of the best gifts you can find. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, you all know who Boris Johnson is, and I probably don't need to explain who he is. There's uh, often been uh, suspicion that he would eventually become leader of the Tory party. Um, but yeah, he, he's he's famous because he's been quite a character. He's done... In the same way some people now are aware of Rhys Mogg because of Have I Got News For You, Boris Johnson got there first on that. I mean, not to say there weren't other politicians, like Ken Livingstone was also on uh, Have I Got News For You back in the day, but definitely there is, he's kind of been more in the public eye and weirdly does well abroad considering he seems to go in, uh, when he was foreign secretary at least, and and, and outside of that he seems to offend anyone he meets. Um, I don't think he's a good example I mean, maybe he is a good example of what Brexit Britain's like, but I don't think he he represents me, uh, would be what I would say, um, essentially. that That's my feeling on him. I don't really want Boris in charge. I feel like he doesn't deserve it uh, after he kind of got us in this pickle in the first place and then kind of, you know, just wandered away from it. I know he got screwed over by Gove, but also, yeah, I mean, I feel like he, he can't just keep having a go at it, as it were. Um so next up, there's Andrea Leadsom. Now, I don't know much about Andrea Leadsom. I, I haven't learned much more about her, I would say, since the last leadership contest, where all I remember is thinking she was a bit more conservative than Theresa May, and that was a bad thing in my mind. And also then she said some horrible things about Theresa May, and that's essentially how she lost her leadership bid. I don't know if people have forgotten enough about that, but she has, like, earlier in the week, she, you know, she was... Um, she. she resigned from her post in order to to kind of like set all of this up i suppose so you know she she's maneuvered herself well recently i i don't know if my opinion of her has really improved since before dominic raab he was brexit minister famously forgot we were an island um don't feel like he should be in charge of anything really um but you know i, I suppose yeah he's heavy on brexit and we've already kind of discussed the pros and cons of having a heavily brexit uh prime minister 
uh, in this situation. Michael Gove, <laughs> we've we've already made the point in previous episodes, I think, about Michael Gove. Um, he used to be a writer for the Times. <laughs> I'll um, do it. I'll yes. drive the plane. I'll drive the plane. <laughs> Sorry, but yeah, yeah, like yeah. I mean, Michael Gove also kind of lumped in with Boris Johnson, a bit useless and backstabby and out for himself, and I don't like him. Uh, Jeremy Hunt, the only man alive who is his own rhyming slang. Um, f- I mean, no one wanted him to be health secretary for like the entire time he was health secretary, apart from himself. And now he's foreign secretary, and he's only doing well in that role, I suppose, because by comparison, he's not Boris Johnson. Um, again, I don't feel like he should be prime minister. Um, Sergeant Javid, he is probably, out of all of them, uh, I mean, maybe there's a few others lower down, he hasn't done anything that's really annoyed me. So I think he's probably like all right out of the options. He's made some, he's done some stupid stuff, obviously, but he's currently Home Secretary. And I think he's kind of made the usual number of political gaffes. I can't remember something like really bad that he's done, but please correct me if I'm wrong when it gets to your time to run through them. <laughs> uh, Rory Stewart made some promise about prisons when he was prisons minister that I can't remember off the top of my head. Oh, he made some pledges, I think, about prisons, and then he resigned because they didn't reduce le- levels of violence and stuff like that. So he's made some mistakes, but like in the traditional kind of political vein, where it probably people have forgotten about that. You can Google it, but I bet everyone's forgotten that he was even pr- prisons minister. Um, Liz Truss has had uh, some... She, she's made some weird YouTube videos uh, I, I've seen. Um Again, I don't know too much about her, but the secret barrister, the secret barrister in 2016 was like, after only five months, I can't, uh, you know, support her as Secretary of State for Justice. Um, So, you know, she's made some silly decisions again. Amber Rudd, I can't remember anything in particular, but she's been in the, she was in the home office, wasn't she, after, oh, she, she was, she was the one who fell on her sword for Windrush, right? Yeah, she was, yeah. But really it wasn't necessarily her fault, but. I feel like she just won't do very well because of the association with that, even though I feel like more of the Windrush stuff actually falls at Theresa May's feet than it does at hers. Um, kind of, I think we discussed at the time that she kind of fell on her sword because then everyone will hopefully forget about the fact that she was involved and come next leadership contest, she would be available. Um, but yeah, uh, she is Remain, uh, which at least is, you know, she's in the cabinet and a Remainer. Matt Hancock, who's the current health secretary, I literally know nothing about. He's just very smiley, judging from his picture. Pretty Patel. Um, I couldn't find any obvious thing she's done to annoy people, other than uh, her local uh, constituents are a bit annoyed that they haven't. Re- she hasn't really represented them in Parliament. Um, but n- nothing like on a on a national scale that worries me. Esther McVeigh. I don't know much about either. Um, yeah, she's. A quick Google didn't bring up anything like she's done that's stupid. She's just kind of been an opposition to Theresa May recently. Penny Mordant, um, again, I haven't seen anything in particular that's like she's screwed up. So again, some of these people are backbenchers, so it may just be they haven't really had the opportunity. Um, she's currently for Defence Secretary, to be clear, but quite a few of these people are backbenchers. So they've been able to maybe shout from the sidelines. You may have heard their name, but I don't know anything about them at all um and then finally sir graham brady who is currently a backbencher but head of the 1922 committee so uh i don't know if you've clicked on him on that link but he said i've been urged by a number of colleagues from across the party from inside parliament and outside asking me to put myself forward as a candidate therefore i've made the decision to stand down as chair of the 1922 committee in order to ensure a fair and transparent election process so i feel like i mean may- maybe he will end up just winning because he's been around in the party for a long time and is trusted but I feel like maybe he's um, uh, my my kind of impression is that he's kind of a few people have asked him to stand. And he's like, oh, OK, fine then. <laughs> but isn't necessarily like planning on winning it. Yeah, I think that's fair. And then um, that's my rundown. So uh, feel free to disagree with me or have far more dirt on them than I do. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, them. Quickly, Boris Johnson, I think. You know, you you know about Boris Johnson. You either like him or don't. My personal opinion is that if he had stood after 2012, where he was quite loved by all the country, he was seen as sort of like a lovable buffoon. That was his biggest chance to go for you know a, 
you know, a prime ministership or, you know, that was when he was outshining David Cameron and many thought that this is the natural man to be the next leader of the Conservative Party. Usually that doesn't happen. Uh, natural leaders of the Conservative Party don't tend to do well. Um, there are many examples through history like Anthony Eden and Sir Douglas Hume. Um, you know, usually the obvious front runner doesn't always do best. And I think he may just be past his prime. Uh, Andrea Leadsom, I don't think she's going to win primarily because the fact that she didn't win last time against Theresa May. She's sort of running, in the, running again because she can. But all I know from my knowledge of her workings within the government as leader of the government and her actual effectiveness as a member of cabinet is that she's pretty rubbish. So <laughs> I, I, I would I would not like to see her leader. And, you know, she's along the Christopher Failing, sorry, Grayling um, ministership. She's not that, you know, I just don't think she's that competent. Um, Dominic Rabb, again, is an odd one. He, I think Dominic Rabb seems to think very highly of himself, but I'm not sure anybody else within the Conservative Party does. Um, he was very excited about becoming Brexit minister and then promptly resigned. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, again, I don't see him as a serious contender. Uh, Michael Gove, um, talking about people who think a lot about themselves. Uh, we've got Michael Gove here. Um, he will do it. He will step forward, even if nobody, nobody really wants him to step forward at all. Um, so <laughs> he's throwing his he's throwing his cap into the ring. But I, again, I don't expect that he will have the groundswell of support from within the party to get very far. Um, Jeremy Hunt's more interesting. I think Jeremy Hunt is one who is probably quite widely disliked by the general public because of his, you know, his control of the NHS in particular. Um, however, he is seen as there's a reason why he's been in government so long and in the cabinet so long. They They clearly like him within the party and feel that even though we might not agree with his decisions, he's at least competent in following those orders. So he might be an outsider in this race. He's at least a recognisable figure. Um, but when push comes to shove, I don't think he'll make it to the final two. Savid Javid, um, Said Javid is very interesting. He's one of my ones to watch out for. Even though he's been quite controversial and it can be quite sort of right wing and Brexit -y. that the fact that he is a BME candidate, the fact that he would be something very different for the Conservative Party and could appeal to a whole new section of the electorate does make him quite an attractive prospect for the Conservative Party looking to unite. So I'd say he's, you know, he's certainly one to look out for. Rory Stewart, I couldn't tell you much about him. You couldn't tell me much about him. I think he's just standing because he can. Um, Liz Trust, talking about people who can stand because they can. I don't think very much of Liz Trust. Um, a, a lot of people put their names forward. I just don't see where that swell of support is going to come for her within the Conservative Party. Uh, Amber Rudd's very interesting. Amber Rudd is kind of Theresa May 2.0. So do you remember during the 2017 election when Theresa May decided that she wasn't going to do any um, like debates? Yes, she sent Amber Rudd as her proxy. She did, and that left a lot of people thinking, why isn't Amber Rudd leader? She's doing a lot better job at this than Theresa May has done in any of her campaigns so far. So she's a Remainer, she's worked in the Home Secretary, she's sort of Theresa May 2.0 in the fact that she's got similar ideas to Theresa May, but is far more sort of palatable. Um, she's the iPhone of Theresa May's sort of like basic Android status. Um, <laughs> so... She might be able to command some sort of um, part of the party to vote for her, maybe the ex Theresa May faction, certainly. Um, but that might just not be what the Conservative Party is looking for at the moment. They might not want another Theresa May at this stage. Um, Matt Hancock, again, he seems to be a quick riser within the party. I think he's quite soferable, like he appears on the daily politics and on question time and smiles and get on, gets on with it. But again, I don't think he's a serious front runner. Pretty Patel is, she almost falls into the Gove category of why are you running? You must really think highly of yourself. She's, you said that she didn't have any dirt on her, but her, her resignation from the cabinet in 2017, um, when it was disclosed she had a series of unofficial meetings with senior Israeli officials. Oh, some, that was her. Okay. Yes. I knew there was something. I'd heard about her for before. Okay, yeah, yeah. That was that was her sort of going in the face of all ministerial protocol. Like she couldn't just plead ignorance on this one. It's sort of page one of the code of ministerial conduct is that you don't have meetings in secret with other foreign officials. Um, 
And then when she was called in by Theresa May, she was pretty blasé about it and basically dared Theresa May to fire her, thinking that Theresa May couldn't do it because she was too weak and in the end lost her job. And she seemed quite unremorseful since. So, again, I don't think that she would be a good leader of the party and may not be what they're looking for. Now, um, Esther McVeigh sort of falls into my list trust category of why are you standing? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Another backbencher who doesn't really do much, essentially. Yes, yeah, she's very, she's sort of like big on Twitter and, and tweets a lot of like controversial stuff. But again, she's she's like Twitter famous, not actual famous. Um, I she don't was know. a former TV presenter, apparently. So that's probably why she's Twitter famous. Yeah. But she didn't manage to get at Esther McVeigh. She's at Esther, at Esther McVeigh 1 on Twitter. So. <laughs> not that good. Um Penny, Penny Mordant, again, is another one. She's a prominent Brexiteer within the cabinet who has risen quickly and clearly has ambitions for leadership. She sort of reminds me of um, Kelly Hawke's ca- character in The Bodyguard. Uh, but she's, yeah, a- again, I wouldn't say she's a serious contender. These sort of young and up-and-comings, they'll put their hat into the ring, fail this time round, but will use it as a learning experience for the next time. And I feel that's what a lot of these candidates are doing or these Brexiteers who are putting them in saying, well, now's as good a time as any. Let's let's give it a stab. Um, and finally, Sir Graham Brady, I find that really interesting that he's stepped down from his role of the 1922 committee in order to run. I don't think he would have run... Um, like by himself unless he was prompted to do so so that's clear that there is a sort of little sort of corner of the conservative party that believes that this man who has run the 1922 committee so well um might be able to be the man to unite the party and at least um get them all singing off the same hymn sheet even if nobody else in the country has really heard of him um being a sir i can't remember if being a sir he would be like one of the first like lords or like to to run uh, uh, let me just get my point across there. Like, sir doesn't make you a lord, but I'm not quite sure where that... For- I, I can't remember anybody else with the title sir running for prime minister uh, off the top of my head. So that would make him a sort of odd one to stand out. Uh, he's very much the internal Conservative Party man, in which case he might do far better than expected and far better than maybe some of the more prominent figures. But if he was to make it to the final two, I think he may struggle to win over the conservative wider membership. So that's my two cents on all the candidates. Sorry if I've been a bit more dismissive of some, <laughs> um, some than others. Um, but to me, there's there's clear front runners there. Uh, there's a clear sort of remain, there'll be a remain Brexit split. And most of the people coming forward on this are Brexity. So I imagine a lot of those will cancel each other out. And by the time you get to the end, you will be left with a Brexiteer and a Remainer. Um, which Brexiteer and which Remainer, that, that remains to be seen. We've run through uh, the various people standing. You think about half, you think about half maybe are um, just standing to kind of get the experience and then there's the, the actual serious contenders. I feel we kind of agreed on Sajid though, being kind of probably most likely hasn't made any major screw-ups. And I think that would be interesting, as you say. So I said I gave earlier the, the fact that there's eight men and, and six women, but there are only uh, only two of them, uh, Sajid and uh, Pretty, who are um, uh, BAME members of Parliament. So, yeah, may, maybe that is a strategy that could could win out because they can say, "Well, oh, more of a man of the people or woman of the people." Although, as you said, probably more likely that he's going to win out of the two of them. Um, so, I suppose we should probably wrap up there did what what one one wild question how likely do you think a general election is off the back of this uh low again yeah yeah low again like no conservative leader within their right mind would call a general election until brexit has been delivered um brexit being delivered is unlikely through parliament unless they can by some miracle get all of the conservative party to unite behind them um so the the clearest path or the the, the the you know the simplest path for a conservative leader would to go in it would be to go in on a no deal platform i will deliver no deal let no deal happen and then deal with the consequences later uh, not not the happiest uh, thought for the time um but yes um and just for the the front runners so if i was to pick out uh, let's pick out four front runners i would go boris johnson you can never count him out um said javid um, Amber Rudd and then Jeremy Hunt 
and then my dark and then my dark horse is going to be Sir Graham Brady because I know little about him, but if he's got that support from within the party, he might force his way through. And uh, yeah, as you say, he's had to deal with people from all sides of the party, so people probably think. Even if he isn't necessarily on all of their sides, people probably think he's on all of their sides because he's got to be that kind of mediator role already. Um, So talking about general elections, shall we move on into our quick polls update? Let's do that. Yeah, so as always, we're going to... (laughs) As God, Sir Bray and Brady has a lot of teeth. (laughs) As always, we're going to Britain elects uh, to look at their Westminster voting intention. And as you load that up, Rob, I've already had this up. Um, I mean, I'm going to give you my quick overview as always. Uh, it's since we last looked, it has either been Labour or a tie because the Conservatives really fell off that cliff, uh, started in April where they, well, it started, uh, in mid-March, they started dropping at April, they fell below the Labour Party, which had already had a minor bump and they've just kept plummeting down. Labour has also now had a bump starting kind of mid-May, a negative bump starting mid-May. But they're they're kind of tracking the Conservatives down, and they're still about um, five percent ahead. And then we have our new kind of like third place is the Brexit Party, who unsurprisingly are kind of riding high after having had the uh, European elections, where they will have been doing they'll have been in the public eye. I I, I would expect that to probably level out a bit because um, they only have one policy. But maybe I mean who, who knows? There are a lot of people who want Brexit, so. Maybe that they do better than that going forward. Lib Dems are now at 14%. That's the highest they've been in all of these charts that are on this page. Um, if you go back to 2014, I, I I don't know if they go back any further. Um, oh, sorry. Ah, no. Okay. Yeah, so since 2010, that's the highest they've been, 14%. Um, obviously, they had about 29% when they got into the coalition. Um, and then UKIP has fallen off a cliff and Greens have gone up slightly and there's Change UK in there somewhere, but I don't think they're doing particularly well. Uh, does any of that surprise you, Rob? No, um, the rise of the Brexit Party is clearly the factor that's bringing the Conservatives down and Labour to an extent, although some may argue that Labour's also hemorrhaging votes for to the Lib Dems um, as well. Those sort of graphs seem to track with the rise of the Lib Dems and the fall of Labour is roughly the same and then do the same for the Brexit line and the Conservative line. And that's very similar as well. Um, so I agree with that assessment. At the moment, the polls would put Labour as the biggest party, followed by the Conservatives, then the Brexit party, then the Lib Dems. Um, a note of caution about that would be that if a general election was held tomorrow, I think uh, the Brexit party would struggle to pick up a single seat. In the country, much like UKIP in 2015, where they were the third largest party but won zero MPs, the Brexit the Brexit Party just don't have the structure. They don't have the support within constituencies. They do that. They do their their support is spread. They will do best in PR elections like the European elections, where I'd expect them to win. Um, but in first past the post, it's often a very different story. So we've got a temporary what we think of the Brexit party at the moment. Like you said, they're our party with one policy. And when put in a first-past-the-post situation, I think a lot of people might be forced to vote Conservative or have it split or you know decide to go another way um, when push comes to shove. Um, but that's not to rule them out entirely. If they were able to get a similar result that the Lib Dems did back in 2010, they could go into coalition with somebody or they could become kingmakers in a potential government sort of a party forcing through their their Brexit ideals onto another. Um, so yeah, that that's all I've got to say on the polls. And just like a just a quick note of caution about that Brexit party figure. They they look impressive and they've risen out of nowhere. Um, but I don't expect that they'll be taking the top spot anytime soon. They're just there to ensure Nigel Farage gets his European lunches still. Yes, make sure he gets his spot on question time. Yeah, yeah, because he's still leader of a party. <laughs> yes. So um, yeah. Well, thank you as always for joining me, Rob. Um, just some quick notes here. We want to cover the election results. I'm not going to be in the country uh, for a bit, so I'm going to get this episode up uh, and down on everyone's phones, hopefully before tomorrow morning. Uh, and then we're going to try and do a recording with me in another country. Uh, I've got my my travelling kit with me uh, to try, but um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. We'll be running over the, the election results as and when they come out. So they come out, I think it's, is it 8pm or 10pm on Sunday? 
but realistically we're not going to be able to record at that time so it's probably going to have to be a Monday recording for those of you who want to come and listen to us talking about elections which are our favourite topic really um, and so that will be interesting and I think it will be very interesting with as we say 30% people polling for the Brexit party how does that work out with the MEPs um, there's been a lot of stuff about tactical voting it'll be very interesting to see how it all turns out uh, and we'll chat about it then um, as always, you can find us in all the usual places. You can find us at parliamentary.observer. You can find us on reddit.com forward slash r forward slash unparliamentary. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at unparlpodcast. And you can find us on Facebook as unparliamentary language. And you can always go and support us on patreon.com forward slash ttss, where you will now be getting our news updates as, as like a, an audio file on there if you're a patron. And obviously it helps us uh, fund some of the equipment and the web posting and various other things we need to produce this podcast, um, which, you know, and also it's it's nice to have that show of confidence uh, from our listeners uh, makes us keep wanting to do this. Um, although I'm sure we'd quite happily keep nattering about politics, uh, even if there wasn't anyone listening. But uh, it's always good to know that someone listens. Um, and yeah, and again, as always, thanks to the, the large group of people in the chat who've come and listened to us kind of pick apart Theresa May's uh, reign as as head of the Conservative Party and uh, and and her downfall, um, so yeah, thank you all for joining us, and uh, it's good night from me, and it's a uh, good night from him. Bye. 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 Jean-Michel Jarre is a fraud. <laughs> <laughs>